holy, righteous, everlasting, glorious Father, as I attempt to preach your word of truth and life, hope, encouragement, please give me a clear mind and a pure heart. Please forgive me for all my sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. And please feel, fill each of us here today and those who will hear this sermon online and maybe watch it. Please fill each of us to the overflowing of your Holy Spirit that we would clearly discern the truth of what you want us to hear, know, and apply to our daily living. In the glorious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. At the famous Minrith Meyer Clinics, you may have heard of those, they're quite famous around the country. In an average week, 50,000 people go there, visit there. They visit a psychiatrist there for therapy. Now, 75% of those 50,000 people will have either clinical depression or some sort of anxiety disorder. Brothers and sisters, depression is very, very real. And it can be a very, very difficult problem for many people. What I find interesting is, is that God Almighty, God Himself, He gives us basically a case study in clinical depression right here in 1 Kings chapter 19. From this text, we find that the prophet Elijah experienced many of the classic symbols, sim symptoms, excuse me, symptoms. One was fear. That's 1 Kings 19.3, quote, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Another one was 1 Kings 19.4, he had suicidal tendencies. Quote, Elijah prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no longer better than my ancestors. Then he had excess, excessive tiredness. 1 Kings 19.5. Quote, then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. He had feelings of rejection. 1 Kings 19.10. Quote, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. <clears throat> now what's amazing about this is that just a few days, just a couple of days before this, uh, this deep depression took place, Elijah had preached one of the greatest sermons of his life. And he had witnessed God's miraculous power in, in marvelous ways. And, and God, through Elijah, had exposed 450 prophets of Baal for the false prophets that they were. And because of Elijah's faith and obedience, God literally sent fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifice that he had placed on the altar. And then, get this, a few hours later, God sent a downpour of rain on the land that hadn't had rain for three years. Now, I ask you, why? Why would a man who had preached such an impressive message witness God's miraculous power in such a phenomenal way and experience some of the most amazing displays of God's glory, why in the world would he suddenly be crippled by fear, hopelessness, despair, and worry? Why? I mean, why would he run away to a desolate corner of the earth and seek to die, to ask God to take his life? But if you read chapter 18, then you begin chapter 19, it's like flipping a switch in his mind. Elijah goes from this incredible experience of ecstasy to this deep depression in almost an instant. A depression so deep, again, he wanted to die. Why, we ask? Well, there's probably all kinds of reasons. But the fact is, he did. And what this tells us, brothers and sisters, is that even the best of us, even the most faithful of us, even 
even the, the most authentic of us in terms of our faith in Jesus Christ. Even the most committed servants of God can suffer from depression. Just think about it. Elijah was the man of God in his day. The man of God. And now he's so far down in the depths of depression, he no longer wants to live. But that's not where God left him. God did not leave him there. God didn't say, sorry, Elijah, you have a, a, a chemical imbalance in your brain and Paxil hasn't been invented yet, so I can't help you. God didn't say that, no. Long before psychiatry was ever thought of, long before relief could be bought in the little purple pills, long before we had clinics and psychiatrists and psychologists, God healed this amazing man of faith from his depression. And what God did for life, he can do for you and me as well. Please notice what God did to heal Elijah. God did not treat Elijah roughly. First of all, notice, God did not treat Elijah roughly. He was not rough with him at all. In answer to Elijah's prayer to die, remember what God does? God lets him what? Sleep. Right? He needed sleep. And then God sends his angel to feed Elijah and lets him sleep some more. And then God sends him down to the desert, to the south, for 40 days and 40 nights. Now get this. And all of that time, 40 days and 40 nights, God doesn't speak a word. Not one word. God doesn't offer any counsel to Elijah. God doesn't sit Elijah down and have a face-to-face -face conversation. No, in all that time, Elijah is left alone. He's left alone. He's given time to rest, to rejuvenate, and to think. In essence, what God did with Elijah was he let him take a break. No sermons, no reprimands, no counseling sessions. Just love and rest. Love and rest. But God did deal with Elijah's depression and notice what he did. First God sent him to church. You heard me right. God sent Elijah to church. Remember where he sent him? He sent him to Mount Horeb. Called the mountain of God. You know what happened on Mount Horeb? Where Moses received the Ten Commandments. You see, church is one of the best places to be when you're going through depression. It's one of the best places to be. For we are God's children. We are God's community of faith. We accept each other. We affirm each other. We love each other. We encourage each other. If there's a need, we do our best to help meet that need. We listen to each other, we help one another, and we bear one another's burdens. But you know something? Church doesn't stop with being in a house of worship. Time alone with God in prayer and Bible study is a very powerful antidepressant. Let me say that one more time. Time alone with God in prayer and Bible reading, Bible study, is a very strong antidepressant. And I'm going to prove it to you. Andrew Newberg, director of clinical nuclear medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, studied the brains of Christians who regularly prayed. He and his team found a dramatic increase in action in the front region of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, the region associated with judgment and empathy. Newberg says, Prayer has clearly been shown to lower the risk of depression and heart disease, and it even improves the immune system. So, first, God sent Elijah to church. Secondly, God had Elijah tell him what the problem was. Now, of course, God knew exactly 
when Elijah's problem was. He, he knew his thoughts before he thought them, his words before he spoke them, his actions before he took them. God knew it all. But God also knew that Elijah needed to verbalize what he thought was going wrong. It's gone wrong in his life. He needed to release it. He needed to get it out. He needed to, to let it become unpacked, as people put it, as counselors put it. So God asked Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? 1 Kings 19, 13. God didn't ask this question just once, but he asked it of Elijah twice. What are you doing here? You see, Elijah needed to vocalize what he thought was wrong in his life. He needed to explain what he thought the problem was. And once Elijah verbalized what he thought was wrong, then God dealt with his beliefs. And they were false beliefs. They were wrong beliefs. But Elijah believed those false beliefs and wrong beliefs. And, and God dealt with those. He dealt with those false beliefs and wrong beliefs that were, that were fueling Elijah's depression. And what was the bottom line there? Basically, it was this. Elijah didn't think that God was doing anything anymore. See, Elijah saw himself in dire straits because he was being chased by Jezebel and wanted to kill him. And he was afraid. And he didn't think God was in action. Something like, not like in chapter 18. In 1 Kings 19, 14, Elijah replied to God and said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and you're put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Now, hidden in the midst of that statement was this basic accusation. God, I've been beating my head against the wall to bless you and serve you and honor you and glorify you and everything just seems to be falling apart all around me now. What have you been doing, God? And so God corrects Elijah's thinking. He basically tells him, Elijah, you're not the only one left. God responds, quote, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus and when you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. In other words, don't worry about it, Elijah. I've got it under control. I have a plan. I have a plan. I am doing something. You just don't recognize it. During World War II, when our Allied troops were making their way across Europe to encounter Hitler's forces, they came across a bombed-out building that was that that had this inscribed um, on the basement wall. It was scrawled on the basement wall. Quote. I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when it's not shown. And I believe in God, even when he doesn't speak. When a person is depressed, they don't think God is doing anything. They have no hope, no confidence. God is not easily witnessed by them. A person in depression needs to realize, just like Elijah, God is working. God is working in their lives, even when they can't see him or witness him at the time. So God sent Elijah to church. He got him to tell God what was on his mind. And then God corrected some of Elijah's false thinking and beliefs. And lastly, God gave Elijah something to do. While Elijah was still in his complaining mood, God basically tells him, Elijah, go back to work. Time to go back to work. I have a job for you to do. Come on. I've fed you. I've given you rest. I've corrected you. You know I'm with you. 
Now it's time to do something for me. The Lord said to him, Go back to the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram, also anoint Jehu king over Israel, and anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. In other words, get busy and get busy doing my will. I need you. I need you, Elijah. I have work for you to do to glorify me. It's time to get a move on. During the first part of the 20th century, J.C. Penney was a man who owned over 1,700 stores. At the time, he had the largest uh, chain of department stores in the country, each one bearing his name. But although he was incredibly wealthy, his life was filled with troubles. In fact, in 1929, events took place that nearly cost Penny his life. When the Great Depression struck our country, it hit Penny hard. You see, he had borrowed heavily to finance many of his ventures. And when the Depression hit, the banks requested repayment of his loans sooner, sooner than he anticipated. <coughs> Suddenly, cash flow was tight, and Penny couldn't make his payments. He worried constantly. He thought, I quote, I was so consumed with worries that I couldn't sleep, and I developed an extremely painful ailment. His health rapidly deteriorated, so he checked himself into the Kellogg Sanitarium at Battle Creek, Michigan. It's kind of like the Mayo Clinic of its day. There, Dr. Elmer Eggleston, a staff physician, examined Penny and determined that he was extremely ill. Penny later recalled, a rigid, a rigid treatment was prescribed, but nothing helped. He was constantly tormented by periods of hopelessness and despair. He said, quote, I got weaker day by day. I was broken, nervous. It, it, nervously and, and physically filled with despair, unable to see even a ray of hope. I had nothing to live for. I felt that I hadn't a friend left in the world. Even my family had turned against me. Then he thought he was living the last night of his life. And he said, Getting out of bed, I wrote farewell letters to my wife and my son, saying that I did not expect to live to see the dawn. Well, Penny awakened the next morning, surprised to find himself alive. And making his way down the hallway of the hospital, he could hear some singing coming from the little chapel where the devotions were taking place. The words of the hymn he heard, they spoke to him so very deeply and meaningfully. And going to the chapel, he listened to the singing, the reading of scripture, and the prayer. He said, quote, suddenly something happened. I can't explain it. I, I can only call it a miracle. I felt as if I had been instantly lifted out of the darkness of a dungeon into a warm, brilliant sunlight. I felt as if I had been transported from hell to paradise. I felt the power of God as I never felt it before. In an instant, Penny knew that God was there to help him. And he concludes with these words. From that day to this, my life has been free from worry. And the most dramatic and glorious 20 minutes of my life were those I spent in that chapel that morning. The words from the hymn that spoke to Penny so deeply were these. Be not dismayed. Whatever be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love, abide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day over all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. He has brothers and sisters. He is. And his promise to each and every one of us is that he always, always, always 
In response to God's presence, power, goodness, mercy, and grace, please stand with me now and let's sing together number 47. God will take care.